Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this co-chair's press conference for the 46th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, which is taking place under the theme of mastering the fourth industrial revolution. Welcome to all of you. Welcome, too, to everyone watching on livecast. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined by our co-chairs for this annual meeting. Uh, just to introduce them, Amira Yawi for Al Basala in Tunisia. We have Mr. Hiraki Nakanishi, who's chairman and chief executive officer of Hitachi from Japan. We have Mary Barra, the chief executive officer of General Motors from the United States. We have Satya Nadella, chief executive officer of Microsoft Corporation, also from the US. From Switzerland, Tijan Tiam, chief executive officer of Credit Suisse. And finally, but by no means least, Sharon Barra, who's general secretary of the International Trade Union Conference based in Brussels. So I'm going to ask each of our co-chairs to share their thoughts on this annual meeting and uh, its theme of mastering the fourth industrial revolution, just to share some of their hopes and expectations of the coming days. I'm going to start with you, Amira. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, out of uh, the six co-chairs here, I think I'm the only one who lived the revolution with the use of technology just five years ago uh, with the Tudijan revolution. And um, while uh, this fourth industrial revolution talks a lot about artificial intelligence, robots, and robots taking over, uh, I, in my country and in the region that I represent, the Middle East and maybe Africa also, we are more worried about how humans are hurting other humans than robots. So uh, for me, um, my, uh, my thinking about this is, we're having, we're having a world that is going to maybe 10 billions in a uh, in few years. We are in a technology uh, area and we are substituting humans more and more with technology. We're fearing that and we're fearing more uh, the most is how will these uh, robots become maybe smarter? And I think the most is maybe conscious, more conscious and more emotional than we are. And um, what I think about it is, uh, finally, humans are no longer in uh, this monopole of planet Earth. We are in a free market and we're having competition. Competition is with things that might be better than we are. And this is why this fourth revolution should be uh, the, wh while we're thinking about this fourth revolution, we should maybe start thinking about who are we as humans? What are our values? Wh why are we better than the others that we're fearing? Why should we be uh, the race that is the most important one in this planet? We are the one destroying planets. We are the one killing humans. We are the one messing up with this, uh, with this world. So uh, what should we do? Uh, this fourth revolution should maybe be the revolution of values. The second thing about this forum is um, we are a gender balanced uh, co chair uh, group, and 18% of this forum are women. 18 is nothing. I come from a country supposed to be uh, very anti woman, and we are more than 33% women in parliaments, and we have parity in every election. Uh, but more than that, I was asking, how, what is the percentage of people who are under 30? And that percentage is way less than 18%. So every revolution uh, has been driven by youth, and this, will, this one will be also driven by youth, and the coming one will be too, because unfortunately, let's say older people love progress, but they hate change, while revolution is all about change. So uh, to end up here, um, my thought to you is um, this quote which says, um, it's not by improving the candle that we created electricity, and it's time to create cre electricity. Thank you. Amira, thank you very much. Um, that's a great line about older people loving progress and hating change. Um, Nakanishi-san, if I can ask you for your uh, opening thoughts ahead of this meeting. The fourth industrial revolution is a very important subject for this uh, World Economic Forum this year. And the background is uh, digital technology. But now the uh, people tend to think that the digital technology will change of the industrial forms. But uh, today, 
uh, and through the other uh, forums, we would like to point it out that uh, such a the digital technology will change so many aspects of the society. That's a very important point because of the, uh, the from the business side, business environment is changing very dynamically, and also that uh, we may have uh, the big opportunity to uh, solve the uh, various and social issues through the uh, digital technology. That is a key point for the future of uh, us. The current you know, social issues is not a simple, single issue. Always uh, all issues are integrated and combined in a more complicated way. So the, uh, we set up the various you know, digital technology environment for solving those kind of the complicated uh, issues of the society. The Jap Japanese government uh, recently decided that the we Japans try to the uh, uh, promotion of the society 5.0. The first generation is in hunting, agriculture, industrial, the revolutions, information, but the next five, fifth stage is really uh, the su super uh, smart society. That is a society 5.0. It's a how to contribute of the, uh, the, the solving of the uh, social issues through the digitization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mary Barra, can I just call on you? Sure, thanks Adrian. And it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, as the theme of this year's meeting makes clear, we are at the start of an industrial revolution. And in the auto industry, it's really being driven by the convergence of connectivity, electrification, and changing customer needs. The convergence is allowing automakers like GM to develop dramatically cleaner, safer, smarter, and more energy efficient vehicles for customers around the world. And we believe these changes are as important as when we transition from horses to horsepower. The impact on individuals and society in general will be tremendous as we develop cars that don't crash, that, don't, or that reduce congestion, that are better for the environment, and that keep us connected to the people, places, and activities that are most important in our lives. And, and while we understand these ad advances are fully attainable, we also know that there's no single company or industry or government that can achieve this on its own. At General Motors, one of our core values is relationships. And we know our success depends on relationships both inside and outside of the company. And we need and value diverse thinking and collaboration from leaders that are attending here this week to help sure we're creating this world that we've described for the consumer. And it's important from a General Motors perspective in the global auto industry that we not only play a leading role in bringing the new technology and innovation to market, but that we also shape the policies and standards that will enable the rapid introduction and govern this new world of personal mobility that are definitely within our reach from a technology perspective. So over the next few days, I look forward to meeting with leaders and collaborating with experts across industries and regions of the country and governments to make sure that we're going to accelerate this transformation that is going to bring so much value. Thank you. Mary, thank you very much. And uh, now, Satya, if I could ask you and Microsoft your thoughts ahead of this. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, for me, the uh, real question of the fourth industrial revolution is, is it going to be more digital dividend or digital divide? We're, there's surplus that's going to be created, uh, economic surplus. The real question is, is this economic surplus going to be spread more evenly between uh, countries, between industries, uh, as well as people of different economic strata? When I think about the first phase of this fourth industrial revolution, a lot of it has been shaped by digital technology coming from consumer internet. Um, it has shaped our lives in terms of media, entertainment, gaming. And now the question is, can we get beyond that uh, to really shaping other sectors of the economy across the globe, in health, in education, in other industrial segments? And when I look at that, I see hope. Uh, I see a Kenyan entrepreneur who has gone and created, using data, which is the real currency of the fourth industrial revolution, a credit rating for people living under $2 a day. I see researchers in Sweden really help detect dyslexic students and help them. 
I see government officials in Kentucky or in uh, India using data to intervene for college dropouts and school dropouts and really use the scarce resources of the state more efficiently. This is all, in my mind, using the public cloud, which is a key ingredient of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, to create public good. And I think it is up to us all. Uh, it's going to be all the multiple constituents who need to come together, uh, gov non-governmental organizations, governments, uh, private sector, startups, and established companies uh, to tackle this challenge of creating more digital dividend and less digital divide. And to that end, uh, we at Microsoft are very pleased to see us promote this use of public cloud for public good uh, by offering up a billion dollars over the next three years of credits of public cloud so that NGOs, research organizations, uh, and other civic bodies can take advantage of world-class technology to create world-class solutions and create this digital dividend. <coughs> Thank you very much. Sharon. Well, the world is at a tipping point. Let's not fool ourselves that unrestrained growth is coming back. Economic growth is still stagnant. And you saw the IMF again downgrade its forecasts now every year. We're getting used to this sense of uh, generated optimism and then, of course, it doesn't become a reality. And for working people around the world, unemployment is still at an economic high. It's unbelievable the social tragedy of almost 200 million people out of work, 25 million or more greater than before the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and nobody yet has a solution. Infrastructure spend was the big uh, piece. I'm still optimistic about that, but we're spending less than half of the infrastructure dollar that was uh, actually expected, around six trillion US a year or 90 trillion by uh, uh, 2050. So there's no solution yet to unemployment. And in fact, that's just the tip of the iceberg because the only growing sector in terms of work is the informal economy, the economy of desperation, where people are sim simply struggling to survive. And you saw Oxfam this week begin with a report, 1% of uh, the population has equivalent wealth of 99%. That's a failed global model. Our report, the ITSC report, showed that if you get inside the supply chains, now the dominant global trade model, more than 60% of production of the top 50 com of top of the of, of 50 of the biggest companies in the world, then 94% of the people are a hidden workforce. These companies only employ 6% directly and 94% boost of profits but live on poverty wages in insecure work and indeed uh, often unsafe work. So then of course you saw Amnesty's uh, depiction of depravity in the extractive supply chain with the abuse that is just un unconscionable of child labour. So that's inequality by design. That's a model of global business that's inequality by design. Now there are business leaders here who were uh, Paul Polman, the B team, many others who are trying to change that model, but there's only a few, and we need many, many more. Last year, we saw an optimistic 2015, with the world's leaders, with civil society and business backing them in, a commit to uh, the sustainable development goals. We saw the Paris Agreement, zero poverty, zero carbon. It's possible, but it's not possible on the current model. So my view about technology, and uh, remember in our world, technology's always been grafted on to traditional industries. It's always had some displacement effect. But where there's been dialogue and collective bargaining, we've managed to upskill workers, to in fact uh, increase incomes by bargaining. What we've seen is a model that's smashing that dialogue and consequently demand. So for us, technology can be used to make people's lives easier. Let's hope you're right, uh, Sadia to reduce inequality, to facilitate inclusion or to solve intractical global problems. But without dialogue, without governance, it can be used against the majority of people and even humanity itself. We face climate, conflict and a, and a, and a deficit of a social contract. Can we actually establish the dialogue to use technology to resolve these issues or will we see a world that's simply more of the same, where greed outstrips the opportunities that uh, you've heard from the panel today. 
That's the question for Davos. Dialogue and planning for zero carbon, zero poverty and inclusive future, or more of the same, and increased greed and inequality. Sharon, thank you. Tijan. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning to, to all. Um, I'd like to start by saying that it's a great honour to be here, to be a co-chair, to be on this panel, and to salute all my, my co-chairs. Um, Amira made the point that we are gender balanced, but we're not just diverse by gender, we're diverse by continental origin, geography, size, height. Um, and um, you, can, you can tell from the, the diversity of comments made what is for me at the heart of Davos, which is really to bring people from different backgrounds and different perspectives together. Um, I, uh, I've reached that stage in my life where I have to say often uh, I'm older than I look. So I was here the first time in 1996. So I've done Davos on a personal level with badge, without badge, on the margin, at the center. Um, and it's intertwined with my personal life because in 1999 I, I was a minister in Africa and I got a letter December 15th saying that Davos has designated a cabinet of the best ministers of the 20th century and I was one of the 12. So frankly, needless to say, I was very excited. Just 10 days later, there was a military coup. So I had to, <laughs> I had to, it's very humbling. I had to contact the forum and say, look, uh, I don't think I can make it in January. If, if the military lets me, maybe, but I don't think so. So anyway, Davos has been very, and I came here in my 30s for you. I mean, now I'm in my 50s, I've, but I've always enjoyed it. I have never met, I mean, most of the Nobel Prizes I've met, I've met in Davos. Uh, I, don't, I don't usually run into them. It's a, it's a unique place to, to meet people with a phenomenal intellect, and it's really, really humbling, and it, it, at the same time, it's liberating. I, and I, I finish on this, really. Um, Sharon, you made two comments that I was going to make. I had two words here. You can, you know, dialogue and technology. And I really think that at the heart of Davos, there are two things I really care very much about. One is the dialogue. Just talk and talk and listen to each other. The Asians say that you have two ears and one mouth and you should use them in proportion. I, I like that. I like that image. So listen and, and, and talk. And from that, um, there is always a, a better world that emerges. So. I recognize the, the risks of technology, but I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think that it has the potential to transform lives for the better, from the, the farmers in West Africa who used to be uh, taken advantage of by doubtful intermediaries who can now go on their cell phone and check the cocoa price in the market and, and maximize the income from their little family and take care of their children, um, to medical science and, and analyzing and having a chance to beat cancer. I, I think that the upside is is, um, is infinite, provided that we, we continue to talk together. So I, I fully subscribe to the, it's easy to, to ridicule, but the, the committed to improving the state of the world, uh, certainly that's why I'm here, and I, I've always enjoyed Davos, and hopefully for many more years. So thank you. Thanks to our co-chairs. Have time some questions before uh, we release them into the agenda of, uh, of the meeting. If you can just uh, raise a hand for me and if you can identify yourself and your organization. If you have any specific questions individually based around something, we'll have opportunities offline for individual uh, messages from each of the co-chairs. But uh, if we can keep our questions to the broad theme of the meeting, that would be fantastic. Gentleman at the front, and can we get a microphone? Thanks. And then the gentleman behind. Thank you. This is uh, Matthew Allen from Swiss Info. This is a, uh, a question to Tian. Can um, you just speak up, Matthew? Yeah, sorry. Um, Matthew Allen, Swiss Info is a question okay. for uh, Mr. Tian. Um, on, on the question of jobs um, and how, they, how the fourth industrial revolution will affect jobs for the financial industry, mm -hmm. we hear that Credit Suisse may be cutting jobs mm -hmm. quite soon. How do you feel that the employment situation will be shaped by the fourth industrial revolution for your company and mm -hmm. for the financial industry. Uh, I'm Tha very oh, thanks, Matthew, for just uh, uh, ignoring my comment about uh, trying to keep them uh, to the whole panel. But um, can we just take the question behind? And I think your broad point about jobs is one that each of the panelists can probably address. Just take that gentleman there. Hi, uh, David Sirota with International Business Times. Um, this is directed to the whole panel, but it also focuses a little bit on GM. GM has been criticized in recent um, weeks for um, producing automobiles in the developing world that don't meet the American safety standards, airbags and the like. I'm curious why GM doesn't produce uh, uh, all cars at a certain safety standard, but as part of the fourth industrial revolution, the real question is also, 
should those standards be globalized or not, those safety standards. And that would go for Microsoft and privacy standards and everything that people on the panel work on. Okay, so two questions really on jobs, and uh, Tijan, maybe we'll start with you. The, the threat that the fourth industrial revolution places on job, uh, the job market, uh, something also that Sharon addressed, and, uh, and then perhaps globalized standards, if we can talk some of that, and obviously in, for Microsoft too, globalized standards uh, in, and the internet are something that's very concerning for all of us. So Tijan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I think you're right to raise the question, but it's um, one of the challenges of running a business, but you have to do both. You have to both um, cut costs to be efficient and competitive, and you have to invest for the future. And it's a balance between those two. So um, there is effectively, and we've been very transparent about our plans in, in Switzerland. We've announced uh, how many jobs we think net uh, we will decrease, but that's a short-term uh, issue. Long term, medium term, long term, my, my job is to build a growing organization. My you know, strategy we have was criticized, it was a growth strategy. And it was found uh, ambitious for a bank to want to grow. But I, I really believe as a CEO in charge of an organization, that organizations that don't grow, it's like human organism. They have necrosis and in the end they die. If you want uh, the atmosphere to be positive in the company, my, my view is always that everybody gets promoted every year. Even if you don't change jobs, if I make the company bigger, everybody has a bigger job, and that's how you create a positive dynamic in the company. But, you know, there is legacy. I'm inheriting a challenging situation. You saw that we raised, and I don't want to speak too much about credit fees, but we had to raise six billion of capital. There's a lot of work to do to create a clean foundations for good growth. My, my ambition is definitely to grow, and in the end to add more jobs in Switzerland, not to reduce the number of jobs. Sharon, maybe you can pick up on that point on the jobs crisis. You mentioned unemployment and the threat it places. The vast majority of jobs being lost now are actually because of the collapse of economic demand and a continuing economic crisis. There's no doubt that we will see jobs displaced by technology, but we have since, uh, you know, decades past. The real question is, if in fact there is less work globally, Will we look again at what work is? If we're investing in infrastructure, that creates jobs. If we're investing in the care economy, where, which is actually the biggest multiplier of jobs after infrastructure, then in fact we will actually be investing in each other and redefining what work is. So the real question is, will the wealth be shared so people feel secure, can make uh, decisions about their own uh, work, uh, work family lives, and will we actually see vulnerable communities more cohesive? So the conflict that uh, Amira talked about is actually reduced because people feel like they have a future. So our fear is not that technology will simply displace jobs. Our fear is technology will be used by the few who already have the wealth to simply create enclaves of greater wealth and further marginalisation and conflict. And on the question of technology generally, if I might, not just globalised standards, can I say, that's absolutely critical. We've got to have a new intellectual property model because if we don't share technology across the world, we're giving junk technology again, in, whether it's in fossil fuels or whether it's in manufacturing processes, to the developing world that actually keeps them behind the eight ball. So should people be rewarded for intellectual property? Sure. But can we think of new ways, pools of technology, how can we actually make sure that the testers of the world aren't simply doing this for their own advantage, but it becomes a platform, which is a huge digital platform, but also with grafted technologies from other areas that the world can benefit from by governance, by dialogue, by decision? And just, That's the question. And just briefly to bring in Satya and Mary on globalised standards, I presume the question behind the question from David is whose standards... Uh, would be the globalised standards. Uh, Satya, maybe you can speak I mean, to I can that. start. And, um, I think that the, uh, there's no question that globalised standards, in fact, are very beneficial for someone who's a multinational company like us uh, participating uh, globally. Uh, if anything, in fact, I would say that the lack of globalised standards, in fact, creates more friction, be it in security, privacy, or compliance. Um, and so... We welcome that dialogue uh, between governments, uh, between the regulators, so that there are more uh, global standards uh, that are uniformly uh, enforced so that we can comply with it. And even in a vacuum, what we have done, for example, when it comes to privacy and security, 
is set a set of principles that we operate by around control to the user, transparency to the user, uh, as well as making sure that w operations that we do are sec securing the data of our users. Uh, so those principles are what we stand by, and we welcome uh, global standards. We do not want fragmentation, because fragmentation actually hurts uh, uh, the global trade and global uh, economy and global growth, uh, but having common standards is only going to be beneficial for everyone, every country, and even co companies like ours. And I would just add specifically from the auto industry perspective, global safety standards are hugely important from a customer perspective because if you look at the cost of technology, we have technology right now as it relates to the environment, to improve environment, uh, to improve dramatically improve safety, congestion, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and right now, the industry faces country by country differences that require t different technical solutions, different validation solutions. If we can globalize that, because after all, a person is a person, um, it allows the cost of implementing that technology to come down, allowing it to be made available to you know more people across the globe. So there's a huge benefit from globalizing safety standards. Thank you. Time probably for one or two more questions. Lady at the front, gentleman at the back, and we'll probably mash them up again because we need to Hi, get around. John Lay from CCTV News. Now, here we have the four CEOs of listed companies. How do we balance the needs of the capital markets, that is to pay shareholders dividends and to be profit driven with um, our drive to reduce inequality? Good question. And gen gentlemen at the back, and we'll try and get to you. Hello, Andreas Becker, DW from Germany. Um, I know that the huge of topics discussed in Davos is normally great and huge. But I also know that the forum usually chooses its main topic to be in line with the times, you know, the, the most urgent one maybe. So my question is to all of you, isn't it a bit odd to focus on the fourth industrial revolution when you have things happening like the refugee crisis, unstable regions, huge numbers of unemployment and all of that. Um, isn't it a bit strange? So uh, let me just call on Amira first, just to maybe tackle that one. Is, um, is, are we missing at the forum the point by focusing on the fourth industrial revolution and framing our meeting around that? Or are there dimensions of that revolution that impact on some of those things? The good thing with, uh, with themes is you do whatever you want with it. So uh, whether you want to talk about robots, about migration, whatever you want, this is Davos, you're on the panel, you talk about whatever you want. So I, um, uh, for example, here now during this discussion, we were talking about globalized standards. So of course we can look at it from a, a, a private sector perspective, but we can look at it also from a humanitarian or governmental perspective. How can these governments regulate uh, as Satya says, uh, should regulate the private sectors where there is no globalized standards about in human rights, for example, in the world. Uh, I take, for example, all the uh, big uh, countries, like, I don't know, I mean, I'm just naming France or others, who will uh, talk about democracy in their countries and will share uh, corruption with Ali Bongo or other uh, uh, dictatorships. Um, so uh, it's about globalized standards. How can we talk about uh, equality in Germany and at the same time maybe now thinking about closing borders for the one million because we have too much migrants? Uh, they are humans. What are the globalized standards while we're dealing with humans? So for me, uh, fourth industrial revolution doesn't only mean uh, a tech uh, discussion. Uh, and maybe it can it can mean tech discussion. We are today uh, having we are having today the first generation of nat native technology uh, babies. They are born with an iPhone in their hands. This is new. This is not our case. We are a non-native technology people, and this is why maybe we're fearing that much technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, we, while we're also talking about tech technology, this is something very important in very poor places, like Satya said. Uh, in Tunisia, for example, technology helps 
uh, many people, and especially telephone, phones and uh, uh, internet, helps many people to get access to a market that they would have never dreamed of because there is no real life access to this. There is no transportation, etc. And this is the case in many countries in Africa. So uh, I totally understand your question, and I think refugees will be uh, at the heart of discussions here because this is an important uh, test for humanity. And while we're talking about humanity, we are in the middle of this. The world is testing humanity by handling cri uh, refugees crisis. Amira, thank you. I'm aware of the constraints we have on time. I just want to bring in uh, Nakanishi-san. And just uh, two years ago, Prime Minister Abe announced his commitment to 30% uh, of women in leadership roles by 2020. Uh, and just to the gentleman's question, how do you square, um, uh, sorry, to the lady from CCTV's question, how do you square uh, delivering shareholder value with meeting the requirements to tackle inequality? <laughs> I don't have a clear answer to these uh, big questions, but uh, the CEO tend to think that uh, the, it's not uh, you know, the how to making a balance of the total benefit. The growth, grow, and the uh, increasing of the total benefit. That's the first you know, that the concern of the CEO has to work for. That, that's uh, you know, that, uh, the, the, uh, only my answer, my personal answer to that. And, and so that uh, from the viewpoint of how to uh, activate it of the, uh, the, the ladies, uh, you know, uh, the various activities in the society. It's also that uh, this is uh, very much uh, beneficial to the society. We have to find the benefit at first. Thank you. And uh, Tijan, you want to Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to come in because to, to your to the Deutsche Welle gentleman, it depends if you want to talk about the causes or the symptoms. I mean, the human tragedy, the migration is absolutely horrible, but those are uh, symptoms of much uh, deeper problems, which are around demography. Okay, the Arab Spring is born from demography and lack of jobs. Okay, and technology is really the way, the reason why we're, what we're doing is relevant, is that it's a big part of the answer. It's a huge tool to empower people. People who migrate are people who mean made powerless who want to claim that power back by voting with their feet. So in the end, you know, and I can give you a lot of examples of what we did in Africa. I was very involved in the development of mob mobile telephony. We had to fight the World Bank, and it's an anecdote, but I took a World Bank delegation to a village in the Ivory Coast because they just wanted to dig wells and build roads. And I said, well, why don't you ask the village uh, chief what they want? And this is 1995. And this old village chief, I was forever grateful to him. He said, look, sir, what I want is a telephone. And he said, you know my son? He's a doctor. He lives in the capital. If I have a telephone in this little village, I can get everything I want. Because I just tell my son what I want, and he'll bring it to me. So it's an image. But the, 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 the empowering dimension of technology for people who are in an unfavorable situation uh, cannot be overestimated. Can I just, uh, in uh, 30 seconds, answer the question about shareholder value? Mm. It's a false dichotomy. We have $30 trillion of workers' capital invested in the global economy. We want to see companies transition, just transition, whether it's through climate or whether it's through inequality. And just a few cents on any product would actually deliver a minimum living wage to all of those 94% of workers. So that's not, that's not a question about whether it's possible. It's a question of corporate will. And just to give you one figure, in 25 companies we profiled, the cash reserves, not even the profits, which are what shareholders look to, the cash reserves would deliver $5,000 in one year in additional wages to 70 million people. Can you imagine what that would do, not just for the lives of workers in the Philippines or Cambodia or Vietnam or Lesotho, but what it would do for demand? So business has to stop thinking like that and with shareholders and with the consumers, start talking about how we balance the load. To all our coaches, big thank you. I know you've all got things to go on to. I'm sure you might be able to catch them on their route to the next thing. Thank you for joining us for this opening press conference. I look forward to a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.